Hello guys, welcome back to the channel. It's Gripping Bookworm and in this video, I wanted to present to you something that I typically do not do and typically I talk on this channel either about bookish content or about very theoretical physics concepts but in this video, I wanted to tackle something that is a little bit closer to home. In both classical physics and modern physics, the concept of an electron is very crucial whether it be for the study of electricity or electrodynamics or be it the study of things like particle physics and more niche areas of, well, modern physics. In order to understand the thing which causes electricity itself to begin with, we need to know a thing or two about the fundamental particle which causes this phenomenon to begin with, and, and that is the electron. The electron is something that if you went to any high school and took some basic physics class or chemistry class, you might have heard of. You might have heard that the electron is a fundamental particle that is much smaller than an atom itself, and you have it orbiting or various electrons orbiting you could say um, a given positively charged nucleus and that is what constitutes an atom well scientists of course didn't know this for a long time in the flow of history so they needed to discover these things which we now take for granted when hearing about it whether it be in high school or in university and one of the big things which determined you could say the discovery of the electron and that there is a particle that is smaller than an atom is an experiment performed by the physicist known as J.J. Thomson. In order to set the stage, before Thomson, the laws of electromagnetism, you could say, was pretty firmly established already due to people like James Clerk Maxwell and Michael Faraday. Michael Faraday performed various experiments using coils and wires to show how induced current can lead to magnetic fields. And on the more mathematical side, you have James Clerk Maxwell, which came up with the lovely Maxwell's equations, which basically show shows you the different things which hold for magnetic and electric fields and the relationship between the two. Now, even though he was able to establish all of these things and even though we knew a lot of experimental facts about charged particles, electric and magnetic fields, we didn't know exactly what makes up a charged particle. Michael Faraday knew a thing or two about the hydrogen ion due to his experiments with electrolysis and the galvanic cell, but um, um, the galvanic cell or rather a very early and rough version of a battery even though it tells you a thing or two about two like metal plates and how if you put a connection between the two in a particular solution how you can get one that is becoming slightly thinner and one that is getting a bit more rust or becoming more thicker you still don't know exactly what constitutes what but what past experiments did give scientists is a value for something known as the charge to mass ratio the charge to mass ratio is what it sounds like it tells you something about the overall charge of a given like particle over the given mass of that same particle the charge might not be something that is very well known nor might the mass be but the charge to mass ratio is something which could be obtained through physical parameters which could just be measured in a lab this has been done both for the case of of hydrogen ions in using like electrolysis but it was also the same principle which J.J. Thompson used for discovering the electron. The way he went about this is by having an experimental setup which used the thing known as a cathode ray. The cathode ray though familiar to people who have especially done a little bit of physics right now was actually a pretty mysterious thing back then. It was a tube setting you could see which has some sort of gas in it and and through a particular thing known as like the gun or like the cathode gun it shoots out particular particles you could say by just having the setup be wired like you would have an electrical circuit and this gun basically fires this ray which glows an interesting blue-ish color blue green-ish color depending of course on the gas and substance you have in the glass tube itself and what JJ Thompson realized is that using the loss which were already previously established of electromagnetism and not a lot of complicated math, you can find out the charge to mass ratio of whatever the particles in the cathode um, ray are actually made out of since 
they didn't even know what this cathode ray, this mysterious green bluish thing was actually made out of. And knowing the charge to mass ratio of whatever this thing might be is something that we can do right now very quickly with some pen and paper like you could say scribbling and it won't even take too long. The way JJ Thompson went about his cathode ray experiment is that you have this setup right here which is somehow attached to a given circuitry and this through this circuitry you provide a given high voltage and this high voltage is what causes this mysterious cathode ray plasma beam you could say to propagate in whatever gas is filled in this glass tube and as you apply a particular magnetic field to this area of the cathode you could say glass tube thing then you'd get a deflection of the cathode ray and you'd measure various deflection angles at various voltages or magnetic field strengths now another way in which you can do this exact same experiment is by using something known as helmholtz coils now these might look like something straight out of a sci-fi movie but basically as you can see in the picture which i'm going to display right here you have two big um you could say cylindrical coils right Right here so you have one which is has the same number of windings as the other one the windings right here are from some conducting material um, and you provide voltage basically through these coils which generates a magnetic field basically because you have this thing right here in the middle which is also connected to this contraption um, there are things in which you can use and adjust which allows basically that in this glass to tube thing you have the same shooting of a mysterious cathode ray similar as to in jj thompson's experiment now this presence of the magnetic field especially as produced by this homogeneous field actually causes this um this you could say cathode ray to bend slightly to do the same phenomena you have right here that when you put a magnet for some reason because the thing is charged um it is going to be deflected basically by the loss of electromagnetism as you crank up the current going through these windings you change the magnetic field strength and as you continue doing so this thing is going to bend upwards up to a point at which it makes a nice full circular path right here and the way you can picture this is if we're looking you could say at the front right here of this thing the way i can draw this is basically you have a magnetic field you could say that is pointing like out of the page that is pointing basically to your face that is represented typically with these dotted you could say balls right here a homogeneous magnetic field and in this homogeneous magnetic field if you look at the glass tube in the center there is a particle that is being shooted out of this cathode gun and this particle the moment it is shooted in this cathode gun then it is going to experience something known as the Lorentz force the way in which you can know immediately how this particle is going to move in this homogeneous magnetic field is by applying the left hand rule basically to know um, the direction of the Lorentz force and you can typically do this using like the FBI rule but I like to use a similar one that was taught to me by my physics teacher that I find to be more intuitive and that is basically that you use the palm of your hand to indicate the magnetic field lines going into it the you could see all of your fingers pointing in the direction of the current and your thumb finally representing the Lorentz force in this case the homogeneous magnetic field is pointing out of the page so they're pointing into my hands and the current basically is going with the windings of the coil so in this case if we're looking at it at the front then it is going to go you could say move um, tangential to the coil wires and then of course the Lorentz force is going to be pointing inwards so basically Basically what you will get from this is a current in a tangential direct direction to the wire um, a magnetic field um, you can say lines of course pointing out of the page and finally a Lorentz force that is acting as a centripetal force so this charge is going to move in a circular path and that is
is exactly why you get this, um, you could say, circular beam of the cathode ray. Now, we can derive the charge to mass ratio just by knowing all of these things alone, and it is not even going to give us a lot of spicy math. We can start by saying that this Lorentz force is going to act as a centripetal force. And we know from classical mechanics that a centripetal force is equal to m v square over the radius of something in this case it would be the radius of this you could say of whatever the path produced by this circular motion of a charged particle is now um the next thing that we can do is we can note that the lorentz force should be equal to the centripetal force now the lorentz force itself is expressed as the charge um, of whatever the thing we have right here is times v cross the magnetic field strength this is indicating a vector cross product um, and shorthandedly we can write this as basically being q v b times sine of the deflection angle times a given um, unit, um, given a unit vector. But we're gonna ignore all of the vector nuances for now and just say that the magnitude of the Lorentz force is equal to Q V B and not with a sine theta as we are going to say that the angle of the deflection of this thing is perpendicular to the direction of its velocity as its velocity is tangential to this you could see circular path so it is a sine of 90 degrees and a sine of 90 degrees is simply one so you get that sign out of there and you have this expression right here now the charge of it is a bit of a spoiler but the charge of the cathode ray is going to be the charge of an electron that is what you're gonna find basically to this experiment and it is denoted as E V B. Do note for historical purposes of course that JT Thompson had no freaking clue about the charge of an electron or anything like that but just for notation's sake and just because everywhere online you'll see it written this way I am already writing the charge Q in terms of the elementary charge the charge of an electron okay so knowing this we can write the Lorentz force as we found it right here as equal to the centripetal force m v squared over r now finding the charge to mass ratio is simply a matter of dividing both sides by the mass now to find what we coin to be the charge to mass ratio it is simply a matter of dividing both sides by the mass and also dividing both sides by the velocity of the particles constituting the cathode ray and the strength of the magnetic field itself so doing that we get e over m which is the um, charge to mass ratio that is equal to well divide both sides by VB which means that VB goes away on this side and you're left right here with just um, V over B R as when you divide by VB here you get um, VB in the denominator right here and you have V squared right here this V squared divides by this which just makes it V right here and um, the B is multiplied by the R in the denominator already on this side so this gives you the charge to mass ratio and the velocity of the charged particles you could see can also be obtained without knowing anything about the cathode um, ray um, you could say particle constituents but just by using some principles of classical mechanics so the one which you typically used right here is the work energy theorem and that tells you that the total work done on a given system is equal to the change in its kinetic energy the change in its T and this is pretty awesome the change in the kinetic energy of this thing is just going to be a half m v squared which already has the velocity term in there. And the work in this case, in the case of electrostatics, the work is equal to minus the, um, you could say the potential energy. And minus the potential energy, the potential energy in the case of electrostatic is equal to Q delta V. Um, Q delta V, in this case V representing voltage, means that the work can be represented as minus Q 
V right here. Now the only thing that is a little bit of a spoiler and that deviates from the way that JJ Thompson did this thing is that basically using the work energy theorem we arrived at an equation which gives us the kinetic energy since we know that the work is equal to the change in the kinetic energy. We got an equation that gives us the kinetic energy equals minus Q and technically that is this is delta V but we can just say that it is V a voltage that is read from your given apparatus um, the only thing is that we kind of already know that this um, cathode ray is at least constituted by negatively charged particles and this was measured by JJ Thompson basically by not having just a magnetic field but also electric fields being you could say parallel to this glass tube and that kind of indicated the way in which this beam was basically um, bending it showed basically whether or not it was a positively charged beam or a negatively charged beam and he found that to be a negatively charged beam so with that preconceived knowledge knowing that a priori we can basically already know that this firstly is going to be the elementary charge it is the charge of what we're going to find is the electron and the charge of the electron is technically negative e it is negative of the elementary charge so plugging this in here means that we have negative well, I will write it like this right here. And taking the number, the minus ones out, that means that we're going to give EV, which is pretty cool. This is what gives us our work basically. And also what is going to give us, well, our kinetic energy. So it is going to be equal to EV. Now we can rearrange and find for the velocity. And that is going to be great because then we will get rid of this velocity term right here in terms of the charge to mass ratio. And we will have it expressed in only terms of the um, voltage, the magnetic field strength and the radius, all of which are things which basically we can find experimentally. So let's do just that. So this is basically the velocity at which the particles which the cathode, ray to, the cathode rays are constituted from. This is the velocity that they go at um, and that is easy to find by multiplying both sides by 2, dividing by um, m and taking the square root of that and ignoring the negative solution of the square root thing. Um, so we substitute that into this equation right here and even though it looks messy, we will find our e to m ratio in terms of voltage b and r. So if we do that, we have And next up, the next thing we do is take the square on both sides. So we're going to have E M square. And if you take the square root, the square root of a fraction is the square of the numerator and the square of the denominator. So that's going to give us just the thing above right here without the square root over basically B squared R squared now the next thing that we can do is that we can notice that this uh, there is an em right here so there is an em multiplied by 2v we can take that out and rewrite it as and lastly, what we can lastly do is divide both sides by EM and that basically gets rid of the EM on the right hand side and we're left with just the charge to mass ratio again, but being now expressed in terms of voltage, the magnetic field strength squared and the radius of whatever the circular path is squared beautiful and for the b there is an experimental way in which you can calculate this and that is if you're doing the experiment it would be of relevance i'm just going to write it here for completion sake basically the magnetic field strength is found at least in this experiment by assuming that you're looking at the magnetic field strength exactly at the center of this helmholtz coil setup the derivation for this especially if you want to use a more rigorous vector calculus type of way is very very rigorous you have to use things like the Biot-Savart law so we don't want to do that the simple way this works out is that you have a number multiplied by the current and the number is given by the permeability of free space multiplied by 4 over 5 square cube multiplied by the number of windings over the radius but in this case of the actual Hemholtz coil so 
all of these things are things which you can experimentally find. The number of windings are typically given in like a lap instruction or you can painstakingly count it for yourself. The radius of the Helmholtz coil is also something that which you can typically find or you can measure, it shouldn't be a problem. And the permeability of free space is just a constant that you can use. So basically you can express the EM ratio in terms of all of these things which you can read or find in advance uh, multiplied by the given current and the current is the thing which you're kind of adjusting every single time as you'll see in the video which I will show you very soon of me myself doing this experiment so this at the end of the day is the equation which is going to give you your EM ratio and this is a very powerful thing as without knowing the elementary charge you can just use experimental values for this and find the charge to mass ratio of your cathode ray. The experiment itself utilizing like this Helmholtz coil and this glass tube you could say that has the cathode ray going out of it is a pretty wonderful thing to see. It is a spectacle to the eyes as you see that when you turn on the you could say current in the Helmholtz coils you start generating a magnetic field and that is going to start curving you could say the cathode um, beam and as you continue to increase the current you also increase the magnetic field strength up to a point basically at which the beam path is kind of it kind of becomes this loopy um, you could say plasma ring which is pretty wonderful to see and you can change the radius of this plasma ring as you continue to play around with the current and do some recordings if you do this if you do your recordings and read off what the voltage that you're using is then you can get your experimental parameters from which you can basically get an experimental value for the charge to mass ratio for the cathode ray particles or what um jj thompson termed to be corpuscles if i'm not mistaken eventually what gave rise to the plum pudding model of the atom a model which utilizes the analogy of a british delicatess which is a plum pudding which is this dough like thing which has like raisins in it which is analogous to the picture which JJ Thompson had from his model of the atom that the atom in this case to do this various experiment with various gases being constituted basically out of these positively charged like smears that has all of these negatively charged like tiny masses um, as you could say the um, raisins in the plum pudding um, of course, uh, this model was later, you could say, adjusted for by one of G.G. Thompson's own, um, you could say, supervisee or like the student, a student which he supervised, which was Rutherford. When Rutherford basically came with his model of the atom, which consisted out of, you could say, a positively charged nucleus around which you have electrons orbiting it, basically, um, which he found through his gold foil experiment with the deflection of very alpha particles and in addition um jg thompson has a reputation for having like supervised a lot of later to be known famous physicists like William Henry Brock who basically discovered the use of x-ray diffraction to study crystal structures. If you think about basically the helical shape of the DNA that was discovered using x-ray crystallography and of course that technique was discovered itself by the physicist which I'm talking about. Another notable student is Niels Bohr who after the model of Rutherford came basically with a model with his own model of the atom which was able to explain the reason why the electrons as described by the Rutherford model are not immediately collapsing into the nucleus of the atom by noting that the angular momentum you could say of electrons themselves are quantized basically to have discrete energy levels basically meaning that the radius that the electrons can have around the nucleus is in discrete you could say quantities. Another notable student of J.J. Thompson was Max Born who made a lot of contributions contribution to quantum mechanics including the you could say the interpretation which we have of quantum mechanics being a statistical science he came up with the statistical interpretation of quantum mechanics which describe everything in part of quantum mechanics in terms of things being probabilistic instead of any other type of view of quantum mechanics and besides that fun fact of J.C. Thompson having um, you could say supervised a lot of famous physicists later on um, there is the fact 
that also basically this experiment, this cathode ray experiment, in the sense of a way, led to the, you could say, initial starting point of particle physics. The study of fundamental particles, things being much smaller than like people were able to imagine. As back then, imagining something like an atom was literally more of a philosophical endeavor that whether or not if you have a block of cheese and if you were to cut it further, then at some point would you reach the essence of what makes that cheese. Some scientists had ideas already about the nature of atoms, but J.J. Thompson started by saying that, okay, well, you might have particles which are smaller than this like constituent big positively charged thing. And this, of course, led to later refinements and such, and eventually to a whole regime of particle physics. And using magnetic fields to deflect charged particles is still something that is used in our modern big particle colliders today. And as a fun little side note to end this video, um, the phenomena in which you see with the cathode ray and such, it is also responsible for one of the beauties of nature that you can actually go out there and see. If you're lucky enough to live in one of the northern like Nordic countries, or for some reason, though I don't know who you are, if you live in Antarctica as well, you might be able to see what are known as the Aurora Borealis. And I think in the southern like hemisphere, it's called something else. But basically, these are these spectacles of light which you can see like these bluish greenish light dancing in the sky and it is basically produced by a very similar phenomena as to what you have in the cathode ray experiment. You have basically that the sun is bombarding us with charged particles and these charged particles basically or carried basically by solar flares contain things like protons and electrons and as they're carried through and as they reach the earth we are in essence protected by our magnetic field and as these charged particles are captured you could say by the magnetic field due to some very interesting things happening with the magnetic field lines like them breaking off and reconnecting at some point you get that all of these charged particles follow the magnetic field lines up to a point at which is like the aurora oval you could say or that is how it's coined and that is basically these rings at the magnetic south and north pole which basically um, collects all of these charged particles and have them interact with the molecules in our atmosphere basically have Having charged particles interacting with molecules giving you roughly the same phenomena as you would get otherwise with something like the cathode ray experiment giving you these greenish bluish lights of wonders basically depending on which molecule they scatter off from so that is one of my favorite like scattering phenomena and it is produced by the same phenomena responsible for this cathode ray experiment so i've been meaning to talk about this for a while but now that i've actually performed the experiment i felt even more confident and talking about it as doing the experiment actually gave me a little bit better sense of understanding as to what this actually entails as i think that actually looking at experiments whether you perform them yourself or at least looking into how they're done is very important in the process of something like physics as at the end of the day physics is a physical science so it is important to still make empirical measurements and test all of your models I hope you enjoyed this video and this was a hopefully a combination of not just Matsy talk but also a bit more on the physics side of things. Hope you enjoyed it and hope you stay tuned for further content. Stay tuned and bye.